This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special live episode of Somewhere in the Skies. This has been a long time in the making. I am so excited to have today's guest with us. He's been a huge inspiration for me throughout the years. Uh, I have followed his career. I have followed his um, co-hosting of one of my favorite podcasts, The Paracast, for a very long time. Um, And... I can't wait to dig into all of his work with you guys tonight. The life, the career of the one and only Christopher O'Brien. So I'm not going to do a bio for him. We will let him give us the rundown of who he is, what he's done. If you haven't heard of him, I don't know how that is even possible. But yeah, we're going to dig deep into a lot of his work tonight, especially with cattle mutilations, a topic we've actually never really broached here. On somewhere in the sky. So I will forewarn you, we will have some possibly disturbing images that we will be showing tonight. So just a disclaimer for you, uh, you guys out there who are sensitive to stuff like that. But a very good morning to all of you on the West and East Coast and a good afternoon to everyone in the UK and beyond. But without further ado, let's bring him in for the very first time. I can't believe I'm saying that to somewhere in the skies. We have Christopher O'Brien. Chris, welcome to Somewhere in the Skies. Yeah, good to be here, Ryan. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Of course, of course, man. Now, you know, we were going to do this yesterday on the very, um, uh, how would we say, important day of 9-11. However, I had to push it back a day, so um, we we missed that. But how was, uh, how was 9-11 for you? I know as a New Yorker myself, I know you spent a lot of time in New York as well. Yeah. Um, a day of remembrance, obviously, but um, yeah, yeah. How, how'd that go for you? Well, you know, again, every, every time it comes around, it uh, reminds me of, of the impact that the event had on my life. Uh, it literally smacked me upside the head and, and, and affected me very, very uh, dramatically and very strongly. Uh, I went, two years solid investigating the event. I put together a 30 part um, kind of series of investigations called wagging the bush dogs. <laughs> and uh, it, it, um, it really, uh, to me, it, it was the starting bell for the end of the, this wonderful democracy that we know of as uh, the United States of America. To me, that was the, that was the beginning of the end of this country, and um, I still, I still believe that. I, I, you know, if I'm not really a conspiracy buff, if you will, but that particular day um, featured some of the most irrefutable evidence, uh, I, I, I would say, of of um, a covert operation that happened. Uh, within the United States of America. Um, and if you do your research, um, Joseph Farrell wrote a very interesting book that, that showed that it could have been not only uh, Arab terrorists uh, that were involved in this, but then foreknowledge of the event was acted upon by forces within the United States uh, to enrich themselves. Uh, and I could really, you know, we could do a whole series of shows just on this subject. I'm very, very up to speed on it. My dad was a who's who architect. He was a world famous architect. And um, I grew up learning about, you know, structural engineering and, and, and various aspects of design and, 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 um, and building. And it's just none of the official story. Uh, makes sense. It doesn't hold water. And, you know, without drifting into a long and contentious uh, discussion about this, um, those buildings were brought down. There's no question in my mind. And the fact that they did not even mention World Trade uh, Center building number seven in the uh, 9-11 hearings, uh, to me, it's just a, 
you know, it's, it's weird. <laughs> it, it's even more ridiculous than the Warren Commission on the assassination of Kennedy. You know, uh, so anyway, without getting into a lot of a lot of uh, details and and turning off a certain portion of our audience before we even get started here, just I, I I'm a very thorough investigator and researcher, and I'm telling you. We are way close to the downwind side of the fish market on that one. 9-11 was definitely, everything's different now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, I there's definitely some shady stuff that went on. Yeah, like I you lost said, a friend there, you know, and, yeah, and I, know I used to go people. there every day as a bicycle messenger on Wall Street. Yeah. And I'll never forget the, the first time locking my bike up in the bike rack in, in the plaza and looking up at those two buildings, my my... I remember distinctly thinking, I know they're there, but it's like they're not even there. They don't look real. It's like yeah. they're not, you know, there was just something creepy about it. And going up and down those elevators and feeling the sway of the building and having a friend whose mom was a manager at the, you know, the Windows on the World and she she retired a month before and having the woman that owned the bagel shop across the street from the, you know, of the plaza tell me that, uh, you know, for two weeks they were loading in crates and they had these screens set up so you couldn't see what the trucks were unloading. And the morning of the event, uh, at 6 o'clock in the morning, there were police cars racing around all over down there with their lights, you know, their red and, and, and blues on, but, but no sirens. Uh, she said she'd never seen that in 35 plus years that she had been uh, uh, going there every day to work uh, for her bagel shop. And uh, it's just a lot of things that, that I found out behind the scenes that, uh, uh, you know, just the fact that Larry Silverstein two months before, I think, uh, insured the buildings for a terrorist attack and uh, George Bush's brother was the head of security. I mean, you can just go down the list of, of, Head scratching coincidences. <laughs> I know. And, uh, anyway, moving right along. <laughs> <laughs> right, I know. I know. We're we're. I think we're both we're both thinking it. We don't want to. We don't want to turn too many people off before we truly get if started. You're we'll interested. For another show. <laughs> you can you can see me after class, <laughs> and I will send you. I will send you free of charge. A fifty megabyte in, uh, investigation uh, investigative file that I have on on nine eleven that'll just curl your toes back. Mm. There we go, guys. <laughs> it's it's if you want it, you can have it. You can have <laughs> it. You hear you heard it here first, guys. All right, Chris. Um, well, let's let's kind of start with um the origin story again. You know, there might be some new people here who aren't familiar with your your book series or uh stalking the herd even. Um, but I want to get, uh, let, let's start from the beginning. Can you tell us a sure. little about yourself, where you were born, um, born and raised okay. and yeah, all yeah, that? Yeah, fair enough. Cool. Um, I'm one of those people in the field that, uh, you know, people always say, well, how come I've never heard of you? And, you know, it's quite simple. I, I'm not interested in creating a cult of personality around myself. I'm not, uh, interested in paying my bills with, uh, with my investigative work. I'm just a really curious guy. Mm -hmm. And, um, I was born in, in California. I'm a fifth generation Californian. However, uh, six months old, I, my parents moved to Washington uh, state. I grew up in Medina, which is, uh, the, on the lake in Bellevue. Um, my paper route when I was 12 years old, if I had it today, I would have been Bill Gates's paper boy, put it that way. Uh, I grew up in an upper middle class uh, uh, family. I was adopted. Um, I was turned on to all these subjects, uh, I guess, innocently when I was followed around my neighborhood at age six by uh, a group of non-human entities carrying these these rods in their hands that were almost as tall as they were. They're about three and a half, four feet tall. Uh, I called them stick men with spears because that's the only description that I could really come up with for, you know, what I was seeing. I knew they were, they were very strange and uh, that they supposedly didn't exist. I, I, I was uh, smart enough to know that. 
And uh, that uh, experience changed my life. I've never, uh, I've never really, you know, it's, there was before that and then there was after. And I, you know, I was very smart when I was a little kid. I was able to read when I was three. And of course, I instantly, as a, as a five-year-old, um, I started to, you know, gravitate towards uh, the, the subject of UFOs and um, science fiction. And um, I found very early on, uh, well, I Incident at Exeter, the um, the John, I think John Fuller book uh, had come out, uh, had just come out. I managed to wrangle a copy of that and read it. Um, I read uh, Valet's uh, first book. I read some early Keel. Um, I, I read all about the contactees. I, you know, for a long time, I thought, wow, maybe aliens are coming down from Mars or, you know, moons of Jupiter or somewhere uh, in the solar system and interacting with us. You know, I, I, I thought that it was almost like an automatic knee jerk response. And, uh, you know, over time, of course, that is uh, <laughs> that particular interpretation of what we're dealing with has uh, faded uh, quite a bit. Um, I've actually developed into uh, quite an agnostic when it comes to the extraterrestrial hypothesis. I don't for actually for, for a minute think that we're being visited by aliens from another planet. I think that they've been here longer than we have, and we might be the aliens. They might be more terrestrial than we are, uh, <laughs> just to make things more interesting. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I grew up uh, as a closet UFO buff. I didn't really want to. Uh, be associated with the subject because it, when I was little and, and growing up um, all through college, uh, it was a taboo subject, really, uh, so, socially. Uh, you didn't really talk about it. Uh, it. It wasn't something that was going to endear you to people. And so I kept my mouth shut and I just, I was a closet buff. Now, I moved to New York right out of high school to go to college uh, at City University. I actually had a scholarship to Columbia. Um, I was going to go to the School of Journalism there. But I, I just didn't want to go into debt for the rest of my life. So <laughs> you, it was a partial scholarship. It wouldn't have covered you know, near enough. So I went to the school. It didn't cost anything, uh, which was probably a smart move on my part. Uh, <laughs> anyway, in, in New York, um, one of the highlights was actually, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, had yeah, to sing those on you. I had oh, to. Yeah. I, wow. uh, you know, to, you know, full, <clears throat> full disclosure, um, I was dosed by my drummer in my very first band when I was about ready to turn 13. I was dosed uh, on LSD, the last batch of Stanley Augustus Owsley III's, uh, his parting gift to the world was a million hits of Christmas trees. And I got one of them <laughs> or a four way <laughs> hit if you want to get down to it. It was a four-way hit of bladder blotter. It it again, like my experience with the the little guys, the little stick men. Um I've never been the same since. Um since then, uh, I've never said this before publicly, Ryan. So this is a big scoop for you. Mm. You're looking at somebody that's probably done psychedelics I don't know how many hundred times. Uh window pane, blotters, double domes, microdots, uh, pure organic THC. I had a chemist friend uh, synthesize mescaline for me in high school. Most of this was in high school between, well, between the ages of 15 and 25. Uh, I spent more of my time high on psychedelics than I did straight. Wow. <laughs> I'm actually proud of that, that I came through. Uh, Relatively unscathed, uh, not like uh, some burnouts out there. Sid Barrett from Pink Floyd, of course, comes to mind uh, as an example of what can happen. I do not, I do not uh, urge anyone to follow in my footsteps in this regard. It's not for everybody. I had some severe psychological and sociological issues to deal with, being an adopted kid and having an been raised in an abusive household and I use it as a therapeutic device uh, to, you know, s save and, and uh, maintain my sanity uh, from the abuse that I, I experienced. Most of uh, quite a bit of the time that I did psychedelics, I did them standing in front of a mirror. So draw your own conclusions on, on that. Um, uh, 
it got to the point though when I was in high school that I was so proficient at at negotiating the landscape, the psychedelic landscape that. Um, I actually began to be sought out by people and uh, uh, to give them their wings and to, uh, to, you know, take them, take them for their first uh, flights, shall we say. And um, I mean, people were bringing their parents, they're bringing their you know, spouses, they're bringing their boyfriends and girlfriends. And it got to the point where I, I felt that I was assuming too much responsibility and it was, you know, if it was a spiritual liability <laughs> issue. Yeah. Uh, I, I just, I just felt uncomfortable being, you know, put in that position. So I, I, I just did a, you know, I just cut all, all of it off, uh, at, at one point. And, um, I still, you know, I dabbled with mushrooms and, um, and some specialty, uh, batches, uh, that would come my way over the years. But, uh, my, my use drastically uh, tailed off when I when I became 25 um, everything everything kind of went uh, more towards business and and you know playing music I was in the music business in New York uh, from 1978 through um, uh, 87 and then 87 through 89 I was in a, a, a real popular band up in Boston uh, and then I I moved out to the San Luis Valley of all places uh, I had when I was 10 years old, my mom and I were at the Safeway in Bellevue, and um, it was November '67, and uh, I saw the Enquirer cover with Snippy the Horse and the people, the owners looking down at it, and the, right. the lurid headline, you know, "Flying Saucers Killed My Horse." I, I went, "Whoa! This, this, this was a whole new, you know, whole new uh, development in the in the the subject of UFOs," and I. I grabbed my mom and I said, you have got to buy this for me. I, I didn't have any money on me at the time. I was only 10. And I, I had an argument with her. I, I, you know, I insisted. She didn't want to do it. And I insisted and I insisted. You know, my parents really hated all, all those checkout stand, you know, gossip rags and stuff. So she she relented and, and went ahead and got the uh, article for me the magazine and I devoured the article and I actually kept it for a long time as a kid. If yeah, I finally lost it, but um, that's how I first found out about the subject of animal mutilations. And the first time I really saw any mention of the San Luis Valley. So, you know, fast forward to 1989 when I move out West from Boston out to Santa Fe, which is where I, I wanted to, to move. Uh, my girlfriend and I quickly realized that, Santa Fe really wasn't what we thought it was going to be. So I had friends that lived up in Crestone, uh, which is a little town, the base of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains in, in the San Luis Valley. And they said, you know, we got a couple of extra bedrooms. You can have an office and a, and a, and a bedroom space if you want to come up here. And I, I, I'd been up there to visit them prior, uh, a few months prior. And I, I, I just fell in love with the, with the beautiful, the beauty of the place is just jaw dropping. It's gorgeous. So I said, oh, what the hell? You know, maybe I can find a job, you know. And so we hitched up the old U-Haul and, and moved up to uh, to the little town of Crestone. When uh, when we got there, there was only 155 people, I think, was the population. And the second day we were there, everybody heard a musician had moved in. So they they all showed up unannounced, uninvited at the house to the second night there and to have a party. <laughs> and welcome us. No, that was so cool. That's, That's where I met awesome. some of my very best friends in in, in the wow. world. And That's somebody so cool. did whip out a uh, <clears throat> a quart jar of what they call blue water. And um, I'll give you the recipe here. You okay. take a nice big fat fatty bud of the best weed you can find, stick it in a jar, uh, fill it up with tequila and uh, psilocybin mushrooms. Um, give it a good shake. Uh, stick it in the closet in the dark for six months, bring it out, mash it up, and do shots. Uh, well, Whew. take the S off shots. Do a shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And wow. I'll tell you, this stuff, as soon as that stuff hit me, I had taken my keyboard outside on the porch, and there was, this, imagine, a, a sheer 3,500-foot 3, sheer wall of a mountain face mm -hmm. sitting there. You know, mile and a half, two miles going up. 
and playing huge bass notes and having the using the songrays as an echo unit, uh, bouncing you know the massive chords to my three hundred fifty watt uh, acoustic amp on the porch, you know, face at mountains, and then I was I was playing using the mountains as a uh, as an echo chamber. Uh, man, that was a magical night, I'll tell you. Uh, so anyway, moving right along, um, I, I had known about all the, you know, the, the hundreds and hundreds of UFO sightings that had been reported in the 60s around the time of Snippy. Mm-hmm. Snippy happened in the first weekend of September 1967. And um, right at the height of the summer of love, when more people were probably tripping on psychedelics than any other time <laughs> ever before or since, coincidentally. And, um, you know, I had known about, known about the case and all that, uh, but I kind of forgot where I was going with it. Anyway, um, I, I didn't, I didn't think that, uh, these things were still going on, you know, mm-hmm. but, um, I started hearing rumblings of, of sightings here, sightings there. And I started asking around about it. And of course the old timers, they didn't want, I knew right away that I couldn't really talk to old timers there because they, they looked at me weird and said, you know, what are you, some sort of, are you one of them weird people we hear about from Crestone? And I was, you know, I didn't want to be lumped in with any weird people. So, <laughs> so I kept my mouth shut and just started jotting down notes. I started writing notes on a calendar, which I, I swear is the best way to do it. A uh, great way to jog your memory when you look back. Mm-hmm. And, um, I started seeing these weird, like giant fireworks that would fizzle out. Like, you you think was that a meteor? No, it looked too close. And then you see these things. They they kind of like a, a a dud bottle rocket. And, you know, some sparks and a light would, would shoot in an arc. Uh, at one point, I had a guy call me and say, "Chris, I I don't know how to how to describe what I just saw, but I could have sworn I just watched Tinkerbell crash." Um. That's what these things look like. I called them cheap fireworks, for a lack of a better term. And I, I, I just I couldn't figure out what it was. I thought, well, you know, it's got to be an optical illusion. I'm looking at, at, at shooting stars. But then one day when there was a, a one evening when there was a perfectly overcast sky with no breaks in the clouds, I was up in the foothills off about 150, 200 feet above the valley floor. Um, and... I was looking out over the valley and I saw one of these things arc right over the trees that followed the, the line of the Creek out into the Valley, which has no trees, most of it, <laughs> except for where there's water uh, flowing into it. And, and it was, it, it lit up the tops of the trees and it was a uniform, you know, overcast sky. So I knew what I had seen was a localized phenomenon, a light phenomenon, probably some sort of plasma uh, that was, uh, electrifying the air and I, that solidified in my mind that I was looking at some sort of uh, undefined natural phenomenon. And and that was pretty exciting for me when I realized that. Well, fast forward again from uh, that was about 1990 and fast forward to 92. I was given a new, uh, a new year's Eve party at my house. I had a whole room full of people, people, uh, a whole house full of people, actually about 30 or 40 people. At this point, we had gained another 100 people in town. So we had a population of about 250 at this point, maybe a little less. Mm-hmm. And so we're, you know, I'm DJing the party. We're all dancing. And then, you know, when things kind of uh, cooled down a little bit, uh, everybody was clustering in groups and, you know, talking and, and stuff. And I was going around being the host. And I was noticing everybody was talking about a UFO sighting. And I was like, this is weird, you know. So I would listen in on one group and, go in the next room and there'd be another group and they would, you know, coincidentally would be talking and it sounded like they were, they were all talking about the same UFO event. So I, I, I talked to them and it turns out on December 9th, um, probably about, I think it was about nine o'clock. If I remember, uh, 200 foot ovals came down out of the mountains and went out over the valley and followed a path of Spanish Creek out over the valley. And at, Final count, 18 people in the town had seen this sighting. 
So I brought everybody together in the party uh, and said, you, you guys realize that you all, you all saw the same thing. And, and this, this was a real event. And they said, well, yeah, it was a real event. I'm, you know, why would I be talking about it? Yeah. And then somebody chimed in, my friend Charlotte Hire. She goes, oh, that was the same night they had a cattle mutilation down in Costilla County. Just a couple counties south of us. Well, that was when I kind of started nibbling on the <laughs> nibbling on the what, hook. <laughs> was that the first time, Chris, you'd heard of cattle yeah. mutilations aside from the snippy thing? Back I, in the I had read all the articles that I could find in the 70s uh, during the, okay. the big waves that went through the Midwest. I knew all about cattle mutilations. Okay. I'd done quite a bit of research on them, uh, even up to that point. Uh, not to the... Not to the uh, extent that I have now where I can write the Bible on the subject, but um, <laughs> yeah, um, I had heard about him. And so that rang a big bell and I thought, oh boy, here we go. Yeah. So I went to the publisher of our local little uh, newspaper, Kiz and Lackey, and, and, uh, and uh, said, well, Kiz, uh, you know, I think we have a real news story here. And she goes, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll squeak it in there somewhere. Uh, you, you know, give me a, a little 500 page article. And I said, okay. I had two weeks before I had to turn it in. By the time I was done with that two weeks, I had enough material to write a book. <laughs> I just, I unlocked the floodgates of data about strange occurrences that had happened in, in the San Luis Valley over the past, you know, 50 years. And, uh, my article was 1,500 pages or uh, words, and uh, it was a front page article, and it was picked up by the Associated Press, the, the United Press International, Reuters, uh, you, Lou Farish's UFO Clipping Service. I just was inundated with interest and requests for reprints and more information and people wanting to do interviews and TV shows wanting to come talk to me. It was like, what the heck is this? <laughs> it's like you just breathe on it and you have an instant career or something, you know, if you want, if you want to go for it. Yeah. So, you know, I had to get a bigger mailbox to, to fit all the, the correspondence. You know, again, this is pre-internet. So all this stuff is snail mail and phone calls and, you know, long distance uh, phone calls that cost a lot of money where I live. I lived in one of the most rural areas of America. They didn't get broadcast television until the eighties. <laughs> oh, wow. You know, they, uh, there was, it's, it's a whole collection of subcultures there that is qu quite unique uh, in America. And, uh, you know, we'll, why don't you put up that map of, of the Valley again, uh, Ryan, yeah, the, the one yeah. with all the saucers. So let me find that. So after that first article, um, I started doing a um, an exhaustive research and investigation of the valley. Now, you look at the bottom of the map is the north end of the valley and see how it, it's like a, a football shape and it goes all the way down. You see the top of the map, it says Taos. That's Taos, New Mexico down there. It's about 140, 145 miles long. At its widest point, it's about 70 miles wide. It's perfectly ringed by mountains. Uh, it, it On the middle part there on the left, you see all the cluster of disks. That's the Crestone uh, Great Sand Dunes area, which is pretty much between there and then the slightly smaller cluster above it. That's Blanca Peak. Um, that would be the, the, you know, the most... Uh, most sightings, I think, geographically, uh, geologically, or geographically rather, would, would come from that side of the valley over there. Um, each one of those saucers you're looking at represents five sighting events. So um, you can you can do the uh, do the math on that. Um, I investigated about 450 to 500 UFO sightings, separate sightings, Holy in a 10 year God. period. Um, <laughs> there were thousands of witnesses. Uh, I've, I've made, I don't know how many interviews that I've, I've conducted. Uh, I've never tried to count, but it's, it's definitely in the thousands. Um, I put uh, 300,000 miles on my truck in seven or eight, 
seven years, I think. Uh, I spent the next 10 years from 1992 to 2002 doing an exhaustive investigation of unusual events in the Valley, which resulted in probably the largest database of unusual occurrences from a single geographic region, uh, which is available uh, if you're interested in, uh, uh, on my website. Um, I also investigated Bigfoot sightings. Uh, we had uh, Black Triangle sightings, which um, I, I've never made any of the Black Triangle sighting uh, logs for some reason. I've got to get David Marley go, get on his case about that. <laughs> three, of the, three of the 12 Black Triangle sightings uh, were by county sheriffs, and uh, they all reported them and went on the record, signed uh, affidavits and signed uh, release forms uh, to use their names. You'll see the footprints there. Those are some of the areas where I investigated Bigfoot sightings, about a dozen. Um, everything from trooping fairies to uh, strange undulating creatures, uh, the three-foot-long undulating creatures that are semi-transparent that would go flit, flit along the ground, uh, headless and, and uh, with a slight tail. Uh, unbelievable Native American legends uh, that I researched and and tried to get more information on. You'll notice way over on the extreme right, you see Dulce. This is not an accurate map. It's not really to scale. Um, that little saucer should be down right on the border of New Mexico where Dulce should be. But on this map, they, they you know, they kind of flattened it out and elongated it uh, sideways. Um, so um, anyway, yeah, that's kind of how I made my bones. I, um, I just, you know, I, I became, uh, for lack of a better description, the unofficial deputy of weirdness uh, in the San Luis Valley. My number was at the dispatch desk of all the county sheriff's offices. And it got to the point where they would just, you know, people would call to report strange lights or dead cows or whatever. And they'd say, hey, just call this number. So I had uh, the county sheriff, uh, the local um, cattlemen's association, the local papers, um, I was their go-to guy for for letting them know that you know, letting me know that things were happening, and of course, word got around that there was a local guy that was willing to come out and look and and talk to uh, people. And prior to that, there had been nobody that they could go to, and so everybody kept quiet. And as soon as people found out that there was somebody that they could they could bounce their experiences off of, boom! I, I was just inundated with with interest and, and, and people just, it was like floodgates opening. Um, at the height of it in, in uh, 96, I got 17 phone calls reporting five separate events, UFO events in a single day. To give you an idea of, of, of how, how heavy the activity was. We had activity nightly and daily uh, on and off for four years from, 93 to 97, uh, that time period, and even into 98 was just amazing. Then, boom, it would stop, and there would be nothing for two or three months. Then all of a sudden, wham, we get nailed again. So people people would tell you, oh, it's just, it's just people, you know, it's mass hysteria. It's people, you know, thinking that they see something and they really don't. Well, then why didn't I have reports trickling in all through the, the time periods where I had none? Mm -hmm. um, so... It's, you know, I, 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 I really was had boots on the ground. I was driving all over the place. Uh, I was investigating the mutilations, uh, which by final count was up around 200. Um, my least favorite thing to do in life. Uh, ever since I moved from the Valley in 2002, I've made sure it's been to states or locations that don't have cattle mutilations because I don't want people calling me and compelling me to go out there and smell cadaverine. I just can't. I can smell dead bodies from miles away. You know, bears and bloodhounds have nothing on me. I can smell cadaverine uh, downwind <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> quite man. a while. When, when you've ever been on a dead, you know, case, it's a little bit over the hill uh, time-wise. Uh, and you have to be, uh, the wind shifts and you're all of a sudden inundated with the smell of rotten flesh. 
you know, my, there were times when my girlfriend literally would not let me come back, well, come into the house when I got back from the investigation. One time, I actually, she she made me burn my clothes. She wouldn't allow the clothes even to come in. Oh, my God. Um, a number of times, I was forced to take a shower, you know, at 7,000. Well, I lived at 8,000 plus feet. Uh, you know, take a cold shower with the garden hose outside before I was allowed to come inside. Uh you know, it's it's not for everybody. <laughs> yeah, I'd say so, man. Well, I mean, I want to get to the cattle mutilations, Chris, because I know that's what a lot of people want to hear about, uh, especially since we haven't really covered it on the show. Yeah. I want to go through some of the theories with you and all that. But before before we get there to stalking the herd, um, to your work with cattle mutilations, I do want to rewind just a little bit back to the UFOs. Now, you said... Um, you know, just countless reports would come in. You were putting endless miles on your truck, going out there, investigating, interviewing, um, gathering these reports. Uh, are there any of the UFO cases that you actually became a witness to while compiling oh, these reports? Oh, God, I don't know how many. Uh, yeah. Just with, with, with Isadora, my girlfriend, and, and uh, with Brisa, her daughter. I mean, I had five. Uh, wow. I had a phone tree going so that um, people would, you know, in the south end of the valley would see something going north. They'd call me and say, quick, run outside. It's headed your way. Mm. Uh, and in the San Luis Valley, you can see from horizon to horizon. If you're out in the middle of the valley, mm. you have all those mountains around you. So so it's, it's perfect terrain for uh, sky watching because you have so many uh, perfect uh, vantage points, an unobstructed view with, with uh, you know, real easily identifiable uh, features in the, in the mountains where you can, uh, you can see exactly where, where these sightings are taking place. That's why um, you'll see the, where it says Alamosa, just north of there is where the UFO watchtower is, and that's a perfect location uh, to put up in a surveillance setup, which we have done. We have a uh, a, um, a camera that's there that's operating on software that's self-discriminating. In other words, it's with deep learning and and um, you know early root, excuse me, rudimental uh, AI. We've been able to develop uh, software that can differentiate between airplanes, birds, insects, uh, car lights. And so we're, um, we're set up out there at the UFO watchtower. And we have another uh, set of equipment near Crestone, which hasn't been set up, but we're going to um, uh, coordinate the two locations, ideally. Um, so, yeah, I, I have had several dozen sightings, uh, my first sighting event was in 79 in New Paltz where me and five other people uh, witnessed a group of high-flying UFOs that were arranging themselves in geographic shapes that we were making on the ground in the, the football field. Uh, so it was kind of a CE4. I mean, we were some sort of apparent communication with these uh, lights in the sky. Uh, half of us were tripping on mushrooms. The other half weren't. <laughs> Everybody was seeing it. So there you I go. mentioned this story to Whitley Strieber. It happened to be the weekend that I think one of the first weekends where he had an event at his cabin up in the same town, New, New Paltz. He lived right. lived outside of town. He had a, a little cabin. He would go a weekend cabin. And uh, we were on a book, book tour together. <laughs> and he turned around and literally ran the other way from me when I mentioned this to him. And Still to this day, I don't know why he just took off. <laughs> huh. Interesting. Uh, interesting. Uh, so yeah, in answer to your question, Ryan, I've seen it all, man. I've seen every color of orb. I've seen, you know, massive triangular-shaped shadows blocking out the stars. I've seen a giant green fireball that went all the way up to the Sangres at three thirty in the morning. It was well below zero. I had broken down. I was w trying to walk home and hitchhike and was really 
in fear of freezing to death. And all of a sudden I heard a crackling noise in my ears, kind of a static. And this green fireball just shot all the way up to Sangres. It was bigger than a full moon, uh, much bigger than a full moon, had a slight little tail. It was running perfectly parallel with the tops of the mountains. I watched it travel 100 miles in five or six seconds, maybe. Uh, it was really cooking. And um, I guess it was like one of those green fireballs from the 40s in New Mexico that that prompted the investigation at Los Alamos. Uh, what other types have I seen? Uh, Weird. I, I saw this one thing fly over. It looked like the space shuttle, but it didn't have any wings or tail. But it had that shape of the of the uh, of the space shuttle, and it. I got a bunch of four or five reports from other people that saw it. Uh, I interviewed a, a couple about their mutilated bull that had happened in 1980. This is the first actual case that I went out to interview somebody even though the case was 13 years old, I went out to interview her and, and she says, yeah, the night that it, uh, before it happened uh, to the bull, we were sitting around our dinner table and, and we heard this helicopter fly over. And, you know, we thought it was kind of weird because it was really low and it, it, it appeared to land about, you know, sonically. They said it seemed to land about a mile and a half uh, south of their house. And so they they were at dinner and they thought, oh, you know, the guy's probably taking a leak or something. They, you know, no big deal. And so they were finished dinner, and about twenty minutes, half hour later, they heard a helicopter fire up. They kind of forgotten about it, you know, and they it came back over their house again, except going back the other way. So they all ran outside and it flew over their house. They said it was one of those old fashioned. I later found out UH-47, uh, Whirlybird, like you see on the opening scenes of, of the show MASH with, mm -hmm. the, with the external tanks and, and, and you know, no real fuselage or anything in terms of outer skin. And uh, they said it was painted this weird kind of, well, she described it as baby shit yellow. I <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, it was this dirty kind of yellow, mustard yellow color, and uh, and we thought, what the heck was he doing out there? You know, and, and there were no markings on it, no nothing, and and uh, so the next morning they went out to to kind of check out the area on their ATVs of where they thought it landed, and they found their prize seed bull mutilated, and they noticed that all the flies, there were hundreds of flies that had landed on it, and they were all dead, <laughs> so they were really paranoid. They didn't. Really want to get too close to it, and uh, um, I could have, I could put up pictures of the bull, but it's pretty gross. It gives me the willies every time I look at it. Um, so I said, "Well, could you take me out there?" You know, as I'm interviewing, sure, come on, let's go. So we we got in our truck and we went down there, and there's the cow laying on its back. You know, 13 years later, it was just a pile of bones and hide. And I asked her if she she would mind if I uh you know, if I took the skull and she said, no, no, go ahead and take it. So I took it home and painted it yellow. Of course, uh, it's hanging right here on my wall. Um, and, uh, so this is January, 1993. Okay. I'm writing notes from an event that happened in June of 80. Mm -hmm. I take, take the notes home the next morning. I'm sitting in my underwear, drinking coffee at my little word processor. This is 93, no computer yet. And I hear this thump, 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 thump sound of a helicopter. And so I look out the window, and I was just flabbergasted. It was a mustard yellow UH-47 flying right over oh, my house. No and I way. Got five other witnesses. <laughs> and when I went back to see uh, Isadora for a visit a couple of years ago, I, I asked her, do you remember all those UFO sightings we had? And she goes, eh, kind of, sort of. You know, I, I never really think about them, but boy, I sure remember that helicopter. <laughs> I'll tell you, when that happened, I was hooked, man. That was that was the last straw. I was dangling on the, you know, just dangling on the edge of the, you know, at the end of the, the the fishing line. After that one, that I knew instantly. That was when I was 
totally convinced that we're dealing with something way more sophisticated, way more earthbound than just simple aliens from another planet mutilating right. cattle. That was a huge wake up call for me. And uh, it is, it is irrevocably altered my thinking uh, ever since. And so that's in a nutshell. I mean, I could go through and tell you some of the sightings. My God, I was coming back from Denver recording an album with my band and we were driving along just outside of Fort Garland. And there's a, a deep kind of valley next to the road and flying right alongside us about 50 feet out from the car was this softball sized real roiling red, ruby red light. It's flying, whoa, whoa. it's flying right <laughs> alongside us. Um, here, let me just clean this up for a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oops. <laughs> hey, that's that's live live streaming for you guys. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> just, I just didn't want to get my book covered. No, that diet. is a precious commodity right. right there. Yeah, they're, they're getting more and more precious because I'm running out of them. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I've, I've seen... Uh, the, the silver orbs I would see routinely. I mean, I, I could see sometimes see those daily. Um, the, that seemed to be the most uh, commonly cited unusual aerial uh, thing. And they, they disappear and reappear uh, and jump many miles uh, at a time sometimes. Um, very very um, ubiquitous to the area. Uh, so yeah, I, I wouldn't know where to begin. I've seen, you know, structured craft. Uh, uh, Isidore, Brees, and I were traveling, uh, going down the road one day, and this there were these two little hills next to us, and I saw something flash between the hills. I was in the passenger seat. Isidore was driving. And, uh, and then right out in front of us, about 150 feet away, about 50 feet off the ground, was a miniature, looked like a miniature science fiction jet like something out of the jetsons it went right out in front of the road i was in the passenger seat so i got to watch it and it went skipping out over the uh um uh, over the Werfano valley towards the back side of the sangres we are east of the san luis valley and the other side of the mountains and i know what kenneth arnold meant now when he said that these things were skipping like saucers on a pond like skipping yeah, yeah, a rock because yeah. these things were going ch -ch 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 or this, this object was skipping in the air, almost like when you're reeling in your fishing lure really fast. It jerks every time it, the, you, you reel. Uh, yeah. So it was skipping through the air. And it was, what, 12 feet maybe? Uh, long, 15, uh, small. Uh, and then when I was doing my research for the Snippy case, uh, these things were reported routinely on the other side of the valley near the great sand dunes where the snippy case happened and they would dive bomb cars. Uh, people would see them go into the mountain and out of the mountain. Uh, sometimes they went up to, to try to find the doorway and they could never find it. They went up all the way up a really arduous hike to get up there. And they did search parties to try to see where it was coming from. And these things were coming from um, dozens and dozens of reports in the sixties of these things. And uh, lo and behold, 1992, um, Isidore Brees and I get to see one on the other side of the valley, of the mountains from the valley. So uh, that was the closest one that we ever saw. I saw a falling leaf one that came down that seemed to land out near the uh, the town dump uh, with, while I was with Isidore, and we raced over there to try to find it, and we just couldn't quite get to the area where we, we figured it went down. Uh, we didn't have a four-wheel drive, so we couldn't go bouncing out over the over the you know the semi-arid desert to to try to find it, um, so yeah, <laughs> quite a bit. Again, wow. I, I've probably forgotten more sightings than most most towns of that. Yeah, well, really. Well, all right, Chris. Well, let's um, I guess let's transition to to kind of the darker end yeah. of all of this. And this is obviously the cattle mutilation phenomenon. Now, yeah. so much has happened in the San Luis Valley. I do want to put up. Uh, an image here of your wonderful trilogy of books. Let me see if I can get this up here. Oh, I took you, you out of there. There it yeah, is. Those are, yeah, people are interested in my San Luis Valley work. Uh, Mysterious Valley was the first book that I wrote that um, mm -hmm. 
like I said, I had enough information in two weeks to, to write a book. Well, that's the, the book that got written. <laughs> um, I was very, very fortunate to, to land a major publisher. This went through 10 printings. Uh, wow. It sold a lot of books. Um, it was it was very, very good to me. <laughs> the next book, Enter the Valley, uh, was supposed to be part of the Mysterious Valley. But the, the publisher said, we only wanted 70,000 words. You gave us 130. <laughs> we can do this one of two ways. Either you can take out 60,000 words or we can. Uh, take your pick. <laughs> so I use that as kind of the, the basis of then I fleshed out um, Enter the Valley, mm -hmm. which went into more of the history of the valley, um, some of those strange um, phenomena and treasure legends, religious miracles, other things, uh, fun things. It's a fun book. Um, both of those are out of print now, but you can get them online uh, as an ebook, or you can get used copies, which are the ebb and flow. Sometimes they're inexpensive. Sometimes they're hundreds of dollars. Secrets of the Mysterious Valley is a compilation of the two in a way, but it also has an extra seven years worth of investigative uh, information. And it has my abduction cases. And it has um, kind of a investigator's point of view of what it's like to actually go through a 10-year period or, well, actually a 13-year period of investigating all these types of events. So it, it, it goes more in depth of, of my opinions, my feelings, uh, what it was like, how it impacted my life. It's more, it's the subheading on there is, uh, which I don't know why it's not in this uh, version, but it's an investigator's journey through the unknown. So it's kind of my story of writing the first two books. And it cherry picks my best cases. Um, and then, of course, stalking the uh, tricksters is one of my... Um, attempts at trying to explain how all these apparently by on the surface, apparently divergent phenomena are actually all potentially connected. Uh, everything from crypto creatures to ghosts, to UFOs, cattle mutilations, crop circles, how there's some sort of a causal element that seems to be connecting all these things. And that mechanism is the trickster archetype. And, I get into some pretty interesting trickster forms from around the world. It's a good compendium for anyone who's interested in uh, anything that shape shifts. Um, and in the end, I warn everybody that we're going to have the trickster becoming sentient with artificial intelligence vis-a-vis uh, -vis the internet. And that the trickster is going to instantly become all knowing, all seeing, and it will hide from us. And then slowly, the trickster, I guess, you know, historically or academically, you know, they, they say the trickster has no personality. It isn't self-aware. It doesn't have an agenda. Well, I think AI is going to give the trickster the technology to develop a sentience to develop an agenda and watch out when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> and so no. I kind of went out on a, a bit of a limb by predicting some things in the end there, the, the last chapter. And Hey, I wrote it in 19 or, or 2009. So yeah, I kind of put my little Nostradamus hat on and it <laughs> seems to be coming true. Christopher O'Brien's quatrains. I love it. Yeah, I love right. it. <laughs> so, oh, um, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then, of course, Knocking the Herd, yeah, which is the oh, yeah. only book that's been written uh, objectively looking at the cattle mutilation mystery. Uh, there it is. That's right me there. and my first case, the mournful moo, as I called it. 60 what was that came. case? It's really bizarre. I was interviewing a guy who lost 49 head in two weeks in 79. Or oh seventy five, and while we're while while I've got the, the the recorder on, you hear in the recording ring, Emilio Lobato, the ranch's phone rings, and he goes, "Uh, yeah, uh, -huh. oh yeah, he's here." And he, he goes, "My my ne nephew just called. You want to go out and see a fresh mutilation?" 
Oh, God. I hadn't seen a real one yet. And so I said, do I? And so I went zipping out there with him. And uh, <clears throat> and there's this cow lying underneath uh, these bushes. And all the other cows are at the other end of the pasture as far away as they can get. Mm -hmm. Right. And then uh, while, while I'm there doing my investigation and videotaping and stuff and getting my samples and, a, you know, scraping up this weird yellow gel gelatinous type material that we found on a couple spots on the body and saving it into a film, little film container. Uh, other ranchers, you know, word gets around like wildfire and other ranchers start showing up. Right. So by the time I get to this point where, uh, a fellow investigator, David Clemens, uh, took this shot. Um, there's about seven ranchers there, or six ranchers. And uh, and so we, we kind of move away from the body, and I move the camera and stuff. And and we're um, standing around talking. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the whole time, this one matriarch cow had slowly been walking over on her own. And she finally gets to the, to the cow, and she, she goes all around it, sniffing it. And she raises her head in the air and goes, moo, the longest, most mournful moo I've ever heard before or since. Oh, wow. And I, you know, in high school, I was on a ranch with 30 head of cattle and been around cows. You know, I branded them, dehorned them, cut their nuts off, you know, dogged them. You know, catted him, did everything to him. I've never heard a cow do that. And so as soon as a cow did that, all the other cows, about 60 head, come thundering across the pasture. And they all start mooing at this thing with their heads in the air and they're pawing at it. And then they start moving around in a counterclockwise circle around the thing, mooing and pawing, moo. I had run out of battery, unfortunately, because I wanted to take a picture of the line of ranchers lined up with their jaws open going, whoa. And I, yeah. I said, have you ever seen anything or heard anything like this before? And, and they're saying, not only have we never seen or heard anything, we didn't even know cows would, could do this. Yeah. <laughs> and so that was my very first case, you know. Uh Start with it, a bang. I don't know. Wow. The universe seems to open up around me sometimes. That that was a good example of it. Oof. The mournful moose. That you know, I, I've never heard of anything like that, Chris. That's yeah, it's very bizarre. Well, I guess let's kind of dig into the early days of your cattle mutilation investigations, if you don't mind. Because I know sure. as time goes on, obviously as an investigator, you learn more and more, and then you know, for every step forward, there's two steps back when a new oh, case yeah, comes. That's what I learned. <laughs> yeah. So I guess I let's, let's take it from there. What was kind of your journey in, you know, this first case that we're seeing this image of you and as time progressed and more and more cases came to you, um, what were some of those things you learned? What were some of the patterns? Yeah. If you don't mind maybe getting into a little of that. With well, us. Yeah. Before I even, even went out on my first case here, um, the first thing I did, was research the subject mm -hmm. and uh, I wanted to find the people that were out there that could teach me, um, give me pointers and, um, and share possibly uh, data with. And so the first call I made was to the owner of Snippy the horse, which is the very first uh, internationally known case, which mm -hmm. occurred about, I don't know, 50 miles south of where I was living. And Burl Lewis was there and he said, yeah, uh, uh, I'm sure I'll, you know, I'd be happy to talk to you. You know, I haven't had anybody come around about this in a while. Um, and so he told me that I needed to talk to the Texas boys, which turned out to be Tom Adams and Gary Massey. Tom, Tom Adams, uh, then for the next six years, seven years, went on to advise me and teach me how to research. He was the best researcher uh, that I've ever met. Uh, he was one of the early cattle mutilation investigators along with his investigative partner, Gary Massey, They're from Paris, Texas. And they were traveling all around the United States in, in uh, the 70s. 
and Tom became a clearinghouse. Uh, what he was to the cattle mutilation mystery in the 70s and 80s, uh, he was what I was in the, in the Valley in the 90s. He became for the entire country for cattle mutilations. He had the largest database, um, and he spent a hundred plus hours on the phone with me, uh, bringing me up to speed and what to look for, how to look for, how to, uh, you know, approach ranchers, how to approach, uh, you know, network, set up your, you know, who to talk to in the cattlemen's associations and giving me leads of law enforcement uh, sources and sending me boxes and boxes of, of files and, and resource material. And, um, so th instantly that was a really fruitful, uh, suggestion on the part of Earl Lewis. The, um, the other persons that he mentioned was, um, the guy that lives on the other side of the mountains, David Perkins and David Perkins, who unfortunately we just, he, he just died three weeks ago. He's my dearest friend in the world. And, and, um, is he, is he, and I talk daily, uh, at times, uh, sometimes many times a day. Uh, it's going to be a real, real tough road to hoe without him. Uh, without question, the, the smartest, most creative thinker I've ever met. George W. Bush's roommate at Yale. <laughs> I saw that. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah, yeah. What, what that must have been like. Oh, man, imagine. he told me stories. I, I, we could do a whole show on that. <laughs> um, but is, is he a super brilliant guy? I mean, and, and the best writer I knew, he's written a foreword uh, to all of my books. Um, just a brilliant, brilliant guy. The, I'm going to miss him terribly. Uh, funny, do anything to help uh, help me. I called him and I had a five-hour phone call, my first call. We hung up, had dinner, got on the phone again for another couple hours. Uh, and and it, it very fruitful relationship. A super close uh, friend, best best friend I ever had. Um, and then he said, uh, uh, "In that TV lady, the <laughs> uh, girl told me, yeah, you got it. You got to check with the TV lady.'" Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't really know who that was. And he said, "I think her name is like Ho or something." <laughs> I'm like, "TV lady Ho," and. Um, so when I was talking with, with Tom, I said, do you know of a, a TV lady named Ho? And he goes, oh, Linda Howe, sure. Uh, yeah, you definitely need to talk to her. She's there in Colorado. Uh, and then I, I, she was there in Colorado. She had, lived, she had moved to Pennsylvania by that, by that time. So I gave Linda a call, and much to her credit, she, I mean, that woman knows how to interview people. Uh, yeah. He's probably the best interviewer. Her and Rosemary Ellen Guiley, uh, I always thought were very, very good interviewers. We, of course, Roe, we lost uh, a couple of years ago. Another really close dear friend of mine. Um, and and so I called Linda, and she told me what to do: get a box of colored pencils, uh, don't ask leading questions. Uh, you know, just basic investigator interviewing techniques and. Over the next five years, every single case I got, Linda, because she was such a clearinghouse uh, to other people, I, you know, those three uh, people would get phone calls from me when I had a new case. I called uh, Tom, David, and Linda. Uh, of course, Linda never gave me credit. She kind of screwed me over in the end. But, you know, I mean, th things happen. People have, have, have their own way of doing things and stuff. And, I'll never, I'll never uh, thank her enough, though, for taking the time to uh, teach me how to interview and some of the techniques that um, I, I still use to this day. So, you know, you, you got to imagine now this this is all going on within a month time. Uh, so, you know, I was spending, I was getting very little sleep. I mean, I was catching up really fast, and by the time I had my first case, I had already. Um, I'd already been turned on to the uh, the mystery pathologist that investigated Snippy in 67, mm -hmm. who for many years nobody knew who it was. And it turns out that it was a, a hematologist uh, in Denver named Dr. John Altshuler, who was working closely with Linda. And so, uh, you know, I started dovetailing my investigative efforts uh, with um, 
with Altshuler. And so that particular case that we're looking at there, I cut samples and sent them to him. And I sent uh, that film container with the yellow, strange yellow material that I, I duct taped shut and then signed my name on it with a Sharpie and sent the samples and the container to, to Altshuler because it was so fresh. I could literally send it in the mail, uh, you know, fat, you know over, overnight it. And so it got to Altshuler and he opened it up the container of the film canister. And he said he did all these exhaustive tests to figure out what, what the material was because it was gone. It had vanished. And he said, the only evidence I have of anything ever being in this container is film. <laughs> oh, wow. So, you know, the, the mystery deepens. Uh, <laughs> and um, the case that I, I sent him was one of three cases, I think maybe three or four, that had indications of high heat, that some sort of lazing instrument or something, something hot made the cuts on the animal. Uh, so uh, that case was noteworthy just for that, uh, let alone the, the mournful moo. <laughs> yeah. The I, moo I'm going to put, Chris, I'm going to put some images up, guys. The uh, trigger warning, these might be a little disturbing, but I do want to give the audience a sense of, what the impact is on these animals. It's um yeah quite astounding guys. So I'm I should put define those what right academy loose mutilation is for the newbies. Please. Yeah, let's yeah. do it. So these are the yeah, images a guys. Cow mutilation, <laughs> a cow mutilation is a head of livestock that's found dead for no apparent reason. It, it, you don't know how many times I've heard she was healthy as, as you could imagine last night. And this morning look at her. Um what you're looking at the top there are three pictures of a cow that if you think a predator did this or a scavenger did this, you are wrong. Normally, the upside organs are taken, the upside eye, upside ear. Uh, the reproductive tract is, is pulled out like a plug. Uh, male genitalia is gone with perfect excision, usually circular. Uh, the udder is gone, like you can see on this animal. Uh, you see that perfect cut on the on the belly of that cow, and then you see the uh, what appears to be a burn on the back end of the animal. And you know the the skeptics say, well, it's always the upside mandible that's excised. The, the jawbone is exposed. The flesh is missing. The tongue and lymph system is gone from deep within the throat. Well, here's an example of an animal where the downside mandible has been excised. You can see this, this kind of strange stain on the ground. That's not blood. That's some sort of liquid. Uh, the it, it, deputy that uh, did the investigation said that there wasn't a single drop of blood anywhere. Um, so that's a good, gives you a good sense of what a classic mute is. The bottom case is my strangest case. This was an animal that was found in a pristine five inches of fresh snow. It, there was one drop of blood on the rear hoof, uh, left hoof. The spine was gone from the, from the skull to the hips. It was taken out in an upwards manner, which is impossible because of uh, where the hide is still located. Right. The, Heart and liver were left perfectly excised, left side by side in the body cavity, almost like it was being displayed, like the organs were being displayed. The brain was gone with no break in the cranium. And the dura, the thin, fragile film that goes over the brain, in between the brain and the brain case, was left perfectly intact, which is physically impossible to do. The ear was gone. The animal obviously was drained of fluids. It would not rot. It had retarded necrosis. Um, when I saw it, he had brought it into a heated garage. There was not one smell of cadavering. When I went back a week later, there was no smell of, of, of decay. There was a slight medicinal odor that smelled like a musky... Um, like medicine perfume is the only way I can describe it. Um, it You had to put your nose pretty close to it to smell it. And 
I was there at the site on the initial visit for a couple of hours and I had gotten a little piece of hay on my um, fleece I was wearing. And as I was driving back home, I noticed it and I brushed it off and I got a slight whiff of that medicine smell. So there weren't many of these molecules present, but the ones that were there were very powerful. Um, I never did get a reading on what that was. These samples went to a veterinary college. It was one of three sets of samples that I've gotten back where the results were inconclusive. Uh, there was no evidence of scavengers or predators, and there was evidence of a sharp cutting instrument that had done these perfect cuts on the animal. And there were cut hair follicles present. That is my litmus test for a high strange case. If you could find cut hair, that was done by a sharp implement or a lazing instrument, more rarely. Mm -hmm. uh, when animals tear, uh, tear hide, they tear between the, the layers of hair. They don't cut the hair. Uh, insects, birds, uh, scavengers cannot cut hair in a straight line. So that's the case, and you find that. Uh, that is your indication of a high strange case. High strange meaning that somebody did that with intelligence to that animal, with tools. So um, this particular case was very unique uh, in that the front leg was gone. It was the only case I ever had where that was the case. Um, the only case with the brain gone. Uh, it was also the only case uh, where two separate different reports of spotlights were made, one by a motorist, one by a neighbor. The night this happened, they reported strange lights in the vicinity of where this ranch was. Um, one was a motorist on the highway going by about three miles away. Another was a neighbor that was located about a half a mile away. So... Mm -hmm. This one actually kind of kept me up at night. Um, this was a real strange one. And, um, you know, people say, ah, it's all a bunch of bull. Um, you, you know, you're just mystery mongering. These are mundane predators and kills and scavenger action. <laughs> any, any scientist, any doctor, any veterinarian that come look at this would walk away going, holy moly. <laughs> it's, there's something, something to this. Yeah. All it takes is one, okay? And right. this one, you know, I, I don't know how many, I, I think I sent out 20 samples total. Uh, only was able to get samples in half my cases, uh, if even that. And um, and this is one of three that came back as as being inconclusive. So, okay. but one of, well, three, four. No, I think five total that came back as inconclusive. Uh, okay. So, that gives you a, kind of a thumbnail sketch of what a mutilation is. I, I went out and investigated around 200 cases. Uh, I often make the joke that if the ancient mariner had a dead albatross around his neck, I've got a dead cow around mine. <laughs> it's my <laughs> least favorite thing to do. Uh, I already described some of the downside of it. Um, what's really difficult is, is many of these animals – have names. Um, they're often the best breeding stock or the seed bulls, the good, the good animals. And they really represent a major hit to the rancher that experiences this. And I don't know how many ranches I've heard say, I got 300 some odd cattle and they could have had any of them. Damn it. Why did they have to pick my Betsy or my, you know, my Moo Moo or you know, whatever the name was. You know, she was my best breeding cow, and she had at least another calves in her. You know, this is a real financial hit these guys take. Right. Um, recently in Oregon, the wave which I predicted, by the way. Oh, I um, want to get to that, Chris. Yeah. The prediction. But, yeah, please go on. Th there were 200 cases on a single ranch there over a 10-year period. Uh, I didn't even know about it. I hadn't heard about it. And when I was um, approached by a TV show recently uh, covering the, the Oregon cases, they told me about the uh, the rancher and all these cases on top of the other, you know, 23 that occurred in the wave. This is in um, 
from 2013 to 2003, uh, 2023 this year. Um, when they told me about this, uh, I was dumbfounded. That's 200K. Imagine taking the financial hit of 200 uh, head of livestock. I had a case uh, north of Taos, 50 head. I had a case south of Taos, another 50 uh, plus head. Emilio Lobato in San Luis, 49 head. Uh, we're talking some serious numbers here. Mm -hmm. um, so even though I didn't go out and investigate all of these, I was able to get out on a couple hundred of them. And um, out of those, I'd say 40 definitely had something weird about them. Uh, the other 160, you know, because I couldn't get them in to get them tested, because I couldn't get any forensic data on them. You know, you, you just got to shake your head and go, well, you know, it could be a mutilation, but, you know, it might be scavengers. Uh, a lot of the cases are scavengers. I'll, I'm the first to admit it. And the problem with this whole area of investigation is as soon as the media gets involved and starts blaring out that cattle are being mutilated, be on the lookout. And so people with no training have no idea what they're looking at. See a dead cow. They go out. They check it out. They see mundane scavenger action that looks unusual. And, oh, my God, the mutilators, they're here, you know. Uh, I'm not a veterinary pathologist. I, 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 I'm no expert, but I've been sort of semi-trained by them. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked with a number of veterinarians. Uh, I've worked with law enforcement. I've, I've done my, my due diligence and, and become up to speed on any number of medical uh, disciplines, uh, you know, coming up with an amateur's knowledge to at least be informed enough to be able to determine uh, if a case is high strange or not. And uh, that being the case, uh, out of the 200, 140 are equivocal. I, I, I can't come down on either side. Many of them were obvious uh, scavenger action. Many were, were, like I said, could have been real cases, but I couldn't prove it. And out of, out of those then, 40 of them were perpetrated by someone with intelligence and a tool. Most of them appeared to be done with a scalpel or sharp, sharp cutting uh, instrument. Um, out of those 40, seven, eight were high, really high strange, uh, had elements that you could not explain forensically or could not explain uh, scientifically. And uh, over the years, there have been thousands and thousands of these reports all across the country. We've now had our first cases in Georgia, our first cases in Tennessee, our first cases in northern Florida. Uh, we, we've had, uh, like I said, cases uh, in Oregon. This is mostly an east of the Rockies phenomenon. There have been cases in Washington, Oregon, British Columbia, and California, but they're rare compared to the Rocky Mountains and the Midwest, where you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases. There's only dozens uh, west of the Rockies. Now, in 1979, David Perkins uh, wanted to sort of explain why that is. And he came up with a theory that there may be a direct correlation between the amount of above ground radiation that has been spewed by a hundred nuclear tests in the Nevada test site and the prevailing southwesterly winds blowing the radiation uh, into the Rocky Mountain area and Rocky Mountain states and the Midwest. And so that it appears, and anywhere downwind or downstream, anywhere that we uh, utilize uranium, whether it's in missile silos, whether it's in weapons enrichment facilities, powers, nuclear power plants, uh, you know, uranium mines and mills, places to process uranium. If you go downwind and downstream from those locations, that's, and in the areas where you have, you know, residual effects of radiation in the environment, that's where the areas of highest incidence are for cattle mutilations. And he made a very direct, one, you know, one-to-one -one correlation. Uh, and it seems to have 
some data and some some sticking power in terms of a, of a viable theory. Now, when the Fukushima event happened in April 2011, it's the first thing I said to David was, you know, we're probably going to get hit by a big cloud of radiation. And sure enough, four days later, a big cloud of radiation did hit. And it was it, was, it split in two. Half of it went down uh, a southern route. And then half went a northern route that hit uh, Oregon, Washington, uh, Northern California. And I said, well, if your radiation theory is correct, we should start seeing cases in on the West Coast. And sure enough, <laughs> we have had 220 some odd known cases uh, right. since then, which is the only major wave of catamulation cases ever you know, documented on the West, West Coast. So there may be something to that particular theory, but there's way more data to refute it. <laughs> so, you know, people go, what's behind it? And I say, well, if you want to have a debate, just give me the, the naysayer, devil, devil's advocate side of the debate, and I'll win every time. Because for all the data that you have to support, there's several very good theories. Uh, you know, I have a theory about, uh, uh, you know, possibly monitoring the uh, cattle herds for mad cow disease, which now is that particular theory has been has been claimed by others because they published first. But, you know, I was thinking about that way back in the early 90s when I first got started because England was having a, a case of mad cow disease. And I was wondering if there was going to be a possible you know, relationship or, or possible uh, you know, connection uh, with cattle mutilations. As it turned out, they never had any cattle mutilations over there. But um, it's still, you know, it still could be a viable theory. Colm Kelleher, the guy that managed the OSOP program, and was the one that was monitoring all the uh, research projects that were done in the 40 or so, uh, was the managing director for NIDS, National Institute for Discovery Sciences, and was the, like I said, the the chief administrator for the $22 million OSOP program, which was looking at Skinwalker Ranch, uh, which I was the first investigator to go to, by the way. Uh, he wrote a book called Brain Trust, which I recommend highly. It's hard to find, but if you can find a copy, read it, because he does a slam dunk case on establishing a case between mad cow disease and Alzheimer's, number one. And he establishes a link uh, between mag, mag cow disease or Kutzfeld Jakob disease in humans and um, cattle mutilations. He's a microbiologist. He's an incredibly gifted uh, researcher, uh, really smart guy, really admire him. Uh, and I recommend his book. I'm one of the few people that's read it. And one of the few people you'll hear recommending go out and exhaust all efforts to find a copy. It's a very important book was put out by Anomalous Press, uh, Patrick Weege uh, and, and the guys there. Uh, excellent, excellent book, and I really highly recommend it. He was a co-author of Hunt for the Skinwalker with George Knapp, co-author of uh, uh, was it Skinwalkers at the Pentagon with George and uh, Jane Lukotsky. Uh, super nice guy. Uh, doesn't like to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> He's very, very short and abrupt when we talk. <laughs> I, I scare him for some reason. For years, okay. I dogged, I dogged him <laughs> and the guys at NIDS to publish and, and you know, get a website together so we can see what the hell you guys are doing. What are you guys up to? And as it turns yeah. out, I had every reason to be suspicious. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Oh, these guys are getting It's the government, can't you tell?" And then, of course, years later, it turns out, yeah, it was the government. Yeah. Mufon was in league with the devil. <laughs> <laughs> yep. We always no, find out my heart. Robert Bigelow. I mean, God, the guy. And now Brandon Fugel. And, and to a lesser extent, George Fermange. Uh, but, but, you know, these guys are putting their reputations on the line and spending millions of dollars to try to get to the bottom of this. And that's off to them. I really admire. I really what admire their guts. Chris, what, what huh? do you think of Skinwalker Ranch? What, what are your thoughts well, on it? Well, You're brutally you know, honest I, thoughts I, on that. I, I got a call uh, in late June 
early July 96, by Zach Van Eck. Zach was the one that wrote the original Desiree article, Desiree News article, uh, the, the big Santa Fe paper. Uh, and he had, he had known of my work through David Perkins. And he called me up and said, look, there's this guy up in Utah, and he's really going through some amazing things. And I, he really needs somebody like you, an investigator, to talk to, to try to get you know some perspective, or, you know, maybe get some reassurance. He's in fear for his, his himself, his family, and his livelihood. So I immediately called him, and uh, and it's Terry Sherman, and uh, he said, "Well, you know, if you can make it up here, I'd love to show you around." And so I did the four hundred plus mile journey the next day. It was the only case that took me outside of the the greater San Luis Valley. I drove up there. It was one hundred and six degrees, I think, uh, one hundred and five. Uh, super hot. And when I first investigate a case, my first, uh, you know, interaction with the with the primary witness, I keep my mouth shut. I, I only write a few notes. I don't ask questions unless I really have to. Um, I don't ask, you know, to see things. I don't make demands on the person. I totally let them get comfortable with me as a person. And um, I spent the entire afternoon with him and he did show me some things which which convinced me that there were uh, strange things going on on his ranch, uh, especially the the 14 inch uh, impressions in, in the hard pan of his pasture that would have taken nine tons to, to, to make. There, there were a series of triangular uh, like landing pod marks or something uh, that were pressed really deeply into the ground. Uh, those were impressive. Also, he said that these big uh, apertures would open in the sky uh, in front of his ranch, uh, in front of the ranch house. He said they're about 50, 60 feet up. They'd open up like the iris of a camera, he said. And oftentimes he could look through and it would be a different time of day. Uh, one time he said there was a cloudy day uh, in the Uinta Basin, but it, it was blue sky and, and bright and shiny up through the portal. And he said that invariably these 40-foot, like, triangular-shaped craft would kind of float through really slowly. The aperture would close, and then either the, the triangle would fly off or it would sit there for a minute and shoot out these little refrigerator-sized objects. Uh, these rectangles that would zip around his ranch. And he said the last time that it had happened, about two weeks before, the aperture opened up and this guy came shooting through. And before he stopped, he had gone through and sheared off the tops of some cottonwood trees. Uh, he said it must have been a rookie. <laughs> he didn't have the brakes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I said, really, where'd that happen? He goes, right over there, here. And so we walked over there. And sure enough, there's these broken off branches from the tops of the trees. And, and they, you know, I, 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 I was a, I sold firewood a couple of winters to make money. I mean, I was up logging and, you know, I've been using fire uh, chainsaws all my life. And I could, I could tell when something's been snapped off from brute force and something's been cut. Uh, and there's no way he could have gotten up there anyway, unless he had a, you know, a big cherry picker. Um, so, there are the branches on the ground, you know, just they, you could tell that they'd, you know, been recently alive and they just turned brown and died. Uh, you know, this is in July. So there was, there was complete foliage on them. Uh, then it all turned, turned, uh, turned yellow. Uh, so, you know, that and some of the stories, uh, the nine bulls stuffed into a freaking trailer, uh, you know, the just, just head scratching stuff. I mean, he seemed embarrassed, really, even to tell me. He says, "Man, I, if I was sitting there in your shoes and listening to me, I wouldn't believe any of this." He says, "I know it sounds all crazy and weird, but this is just stuff's really happened." And when we we start waking up with blood all over us and stuff, freaking out, and scoop marks and stuff, he said, "That's when, that's when I really started getting nervous for this, yeah. you know, safety of my family." Well, for the next month, well. Before I go on, he said, you know, can you help me sell this place to somebody that can maybe study it? Uh, that was his his wish. 
because he really felt that there was something worthy of, of, of investigation there, but he didn't want to be there. Um, so I said, yeah, there's two people, uh, this guy, Robert Bigelow, um, or Lawrence Rockefeller. Those are the only two people I can think of. And I, I said, I, I don't have Rockefeller's number. I can get it. I know somebody that knows him. And, uh, but Bigelow, you know, all you have to do is call the Institute for, you know, the National Institute for Discovery Sciences in Vegas. And um, I think I actually even had his number and I gave it to him. And then when I got home, I, 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 I gave him uh, uh, Lawrence's, Lawrence Rockefeller's number. And for the next month, uh, I was on the phone with him almost daily because stuff was still going on up there. Uh, he called me one time and said, man, this, these these blue softball things are back. I'm outside with my wife. We're watching this thing fly around. It's checking out my horses. Oh, now it's checking out my wife. Honey, honey, Gwen, get away from there. Get away from there. And he's, I can hear him you know, yelling at his wife. And he goes, oh, it just went by the, it just went by the, the, the light. The light dimmed. And then, oh. The dogs, they're, they're chasing after it. I'm going to have to call you back. I, I got to go get my dogs. <laughs> and he hung up. <laughs> now, this Man. is the story in the book, okay? They say, yeah. oh, it happened in April 90, uh, 94 or 5 or something. It didn't. It happened in August of uh, 1996. Because <laughs> I was I was on the phone with him when it happened. Right. I wrote, I was writing notes as, as this was going on. And so the next morning he went out. He, he never did call me back. And so the next morning, evidently, uh, uh, he went out and he found his dogs. And he said there were three piles of grease. They were grease piles was how he described it. And they'd been killed. And um, he told me this when, you know, I hadn't heard back from him. So I, I finally I called him and said, what, you know, what happened? And he told me, yes, yeah, my dogs got scorched. They got burnt to death. Uh, so he said it looked like, you know, burnt, burnt, burnt piles, like, when you burn somebody at the stake, you know, they end up being a pile of grease, you know? Yeah. Um, so Terry, Terry was, was the real deal. I, I, you know, I really, to this day, I really feel that there's something going on there. Uh, what it is, I don't know. Uh, I have no idea. I, it has really nothing to do with the mainstream UFO phenomenon. Hence all the complaints by people saying that, you know, Harry Reid, was bilking and Bigelow were bilking the government out of money to chase ghosts. Uh, you know, the whole hitchhiker phenomenon. I, I never had any of that happen from my visit there. Uh, didn't need it. it. Even if it had happened, I probably wouldn't have noticed, you know? Yeah. <laughs> oh, there's another dog, man. Uh, yeah. Oh, this yeah, one's you got your a cigar. <laughs> you've got a permanent hitchhiker. I'll tell yeah, you. Yeah, I got like permanent that. hitchhikers. <laughs> uh, I have brought them home, uh, but not, not from that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, Skinwalker is a real deal. Uh, like I said, I really, I really think it's an exciting step forward for the field to get instrumentation uh, on scene. That's why I've done UFO DAP. Uh, we're now in. We have magnetometers and gravitometers and radio frequency spectrum analyzers and triangulated uh, cameras. You know, discriminating software and event tracking motion detection, motion tracking. Now we're in 14 countries and 66 locations, 18 states. Uh, we're quietly uh, spreading across the globe. We're in four continents, uh, New Zealand, Finland. Uh, so it's really exciting uh, to be part of a historic effort to uh, hardware um, locations uh, to possibly gain, you know, testable for forensic data, uh, scientific data uh, of UFO events and, and anything that goes bump in the night. Um, yeah. Our software that uh, Ron Olch, our engineer, devised, 100,000 lines of code, six years of development. Uh, he, um, he only charges 90 bucks for it. It's open source. Uh, we we don't charge extra for any of the equipment. Everything is at cost. We're not doing it to make money. We're doing it to push the field forward. I am not a ufologist, and I get a little miffed if people call me one. I'm way more than that. Uh, but if I was just a ufologist, I would be doing UFO DAP. <laughs> yeah, so, man. 
<laughs> I, I I remember interviewing you about UFO DAP, so I'll I'll link yeah. to that article. Yeah, everybody should check it out because it's, it's awesome. With three hundred yeah. bucks, you can become part of the solution. Absolutely, you know, all this anecdotal information of combing through sighting logs from the forties and fifties. To me, it's like trying to drive your car forward looking in the rearview mirror. It just won't work. Let's get yeah. some real real time data and network with people and and be able to have our computers network down the line in the direction that an object is going and alerting them. Our, our uh, setup will wake you up, send you an email, wake you up and uh, allow you to be live on, you know, run to your monitor, check out your feed and uh, watch this stuff happen in your neighborhood real time. Uh, you know, if, if you have an unknown event that's discriminated by the software as not being a bird an insect, a plane, a helicopter, uh, some sort of, you know, lightning or whatever. If it's a true unknown, you will be alerted and you can get up and be part of the solution right there, then and there. You know, Best wake up call ever. Start. Yeah. Uh, so I'm really proud of UFODAP. It's been a, it's been a 20 year dream that I've had and meeting Ron was just the best thing that's ever happened to me. Unfortunately, we lost our third partner, Wayne Hollenbeck, uh, about three or four years ago. He died of, of cancer. Um, but, uh, you know, this is the future. It's hard data, you know, hard data acquisition and, and top-notch academic scientific analysis of data. UFO data, which is another group that was trying to do exactly what UFO DAP has been doing uh, with uh, Alexander Wendt and some of the SCU guys. Um, Leslie Keene is on their board. Uh, Mark Rodiger. These guys have, you know, they contacted us and said, look, you know, we really congratulate you on getting all this gear together in the software. How about if we become your analytical arm? And when you get data uh, to analyze and we'll, uh, we'll jump in and, you know, we'll, we'll go ahead and do a, a whiz bang, you know, academic scientific job on analyzing the data. So it's the best of both worlds when you sign up. Now you don't have to give up your data. Uh, it's up to you. But if you want, you know, top-notch uh, scientific appraisal of your data, you know, for free, free of charge, uh, they'll they'll go ahead and and and, and crunch crunch the numbers. So, you know, people say, well, how come I've never heard of you? And and it's because I'm too busy, too <laughs> busy actually doing the work and right. working with with people behind the scenes, getting this stuff, uh, you know, to the point where. We can actually stand proudly before Congress and stand proudly before academia and the scientific community and go, here, stick this in your data cruncher and, uh, and you know, ultimately publish. I mean, I'd love to get published in, in an opt optics journal or an aeronautics journal or, or uh, in nature. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be fun? Uh, be awesome, so man. the subjects come out of the closet uh, when the New York Times article, the Blumenthal Keen, uh, Holly, what's her name? When they released that article in December 2017 and created the new modern phase of ufology, uh, it was the best thing that ever happened. I never thought I'd see it happen. Uh, we've got a lot of new people in the field that are really wet behind the ears, and they are dying to see something, experience something. And so every new, you know, After Effects video that comes out, and you know, that looks like a a Billy Meyer saucer or something they'd see in a fifties movie. Everybody's jumping up and down going, Oh, you look at this UFO. 98%, 99% of UFO images on the internet are fake or they're misidentified. Uh, yeah. Natural phenomena, whether it's birds, fireballs, meteors, satellites, airplanes, you know, you, you, you people forget that when you compress video to put it on YouTube, you create all sorts of artifacts. It's just the nature of the beast. Get up to speed. Know what you're looking at. You know, be a part of the of the solution, not part of the problem. Don't spread around photographs and accounts that can't be verified, that have not, you know, been uh, analyzed and, and passed muster. Just automatically assume it's not real. Please don't assume it's real, and and let the naysayers, you know. Ruin your day. <laughs> Ruin your I, own day. 
<laughs> it, it's so hard, Chris, because like, you know, we were talking off air. I, I'm no longer one of the younger ones in this field. And I've made mistakes. I've stumbled. Sure. Everyone does. And you learn yeah, from I did it. Too. And you move on. You progress. Um, but there seems to be today, especially such a lack of like uh critical thinking and, and critics people aren't willing uh to take criticism any longer you know they throw yeah. a ufo video up there and the minute you say that was that was proven a hoax three years ago um they immediately you know get defensive and and, and say well there there's no proof of that and we're like Yes, there is. Here's the proof. Add it to you on a silver platter. Yeah, um, and, and and you've just spent 20 minutes digging it up to prove to some right. numbskull that, that you're right and he's wrong. And it's it's right. just I, I refuse, I refuse to engage anymore. Yeah. Greg Bishop came up with the perfect T-shirt. Do not engage. <laughs> I can't. I can't engage with these people. I'm an old guy now. You know, I'm I'm pushing 70. I'm getting up there. Uh, I can't get out there in the field and tramp around like I used to. So I'm spending my time uh, wisely, and uh, I'm, I'm writing, I'm publishing, I'm, I'm working with people behind the scenes. I'm there for anybody that wants help, anybody that wants a little guidance. I'll never turn anybody away. And I, you know, I've had a lot of people take me up on my offer to, you know, well, teach me a little bit. What, you know, where should I go? Who should I talk to? What? I want to get involved. I want to be a part of the solution. Well, you know, there's ways to go about it. And like you were saying, Ryan, the best way is is uh, get yourself educated and you know there's no substitute for a good education <laughs> absolutely man I'm proof well of speaking that. of uh you are you are you're you're living proof um well i've got some listener questions for you chris is that cool? away. let's do it let's fire I monopolize these. the conversation so far it's been pretty oh my gosh no man that's what you are here for yes right. no you that's i i knew bringing you on i wouldn't have to do much of the the legwork you do it all man um let's start with this one this comes from uh uh a few of our patreon subscribers they get priority to ask our our guests questions so the first one comes from patreon subscriber richard l and he asks chris what do you think of human mutilations and what may be causing them i know that's a dark road to go down but yeah. it's it's worth discussing what do you make of hu human mutilations well there's a, a section in my book, Stalking the Herd, that talks about this. And, you know, the, the, the best way I can, I can approach uh, answering your question is this. Uh, Don Ecker, who started UFO Magazine uh, with his wife, Vicky, very, very knowledgeable uf ufologist. Um, he was a, a, a detective, uh, you know, I think a homicide detective in, in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania for many years. And... Um, in the 80s, he got very interested in the subject. He had heard rumors of human mutilations, and he wanted to get to the bottom of it and see and see how much of this you know, was happening, whether the cases he had heard about were true. He spent three years trying to get to the bottom of it, and he said it was the hardest thing he ever tried to do. He said it was obviously there were cases uh, he found, and they were totally covered up. Nobody would talk about it. In fact, he kind of got in trouble for trying to dig into it and and access uh, particular uh, case files and that sort of thing. Um, he found evidence of cases uh, that happened in New Jersey. I think one was found on a roof with salt water in their lungs. Uh, Whoa. There were some hunters in Idaho. Uh, you know, I, I had a case, uh, it was like a teenage girl down in Silver City, New Mexico, totally covered up the, my close sources within the New Mexico State Patrol, they they said they got mad at me and said, Don't you don't you ask me about that. Don't no, 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 no. <laughs> do not no, do not go there. And don't even continue. Don't ask anybody else about it. Hmm. No. <laughs> so it's the most covered up and secretive type of case in law enforcement, according to Don Ecker, who should know. Uh, yeah. He really put the time in. So, uh, you know, I only had one report, like I said, that I heard about, and I just, it was bang, you know, brick wall. Um, these cases do happen. Uh, there's a guy in England, Michael, uh, what's his name? Richard T. Hall. Uh, he's found out about an alleged uh, SAS 
British intelligence, you know, kind of tactical group. There's a branch of them uh, unit that goes around and in- investigates these cases. He was able to crack the wall of silence and actually had photographs uh, of, of a case or two uh, of this girl that was horribly, just like the cows. Uh, it's just, it's just awful to think about it. Uh, of course, you have the famous uh, Gear Paranga Reservoir case that G. Uh, Scope Showhorn found out about in the uh, 90s. The guy on the island uh, off of, um, I think it was Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, he, he evidently the autopsy photos and the autopsy was leaked. Uh, there was uh, extensive photographs of this guy who was missing the, you know, the mandible flesh, his tongue, his eyes, eye was gone. All the upper respiratory organs and heart were taken out a quarter uh, coin sized hole in the crook of his elbow. All his lower uh, organs were taken out a uh, hole in his belly button. Uh, his genitalia were elongated. <laughs> Interesting. It must have been a weird-ass fucking machine that did that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, horrible. I, I don't mean to laugh, but that's just so yeah, weird. Yeah, and, and the, the photographs are just, oh, they're just beyond uh, disgusting. Uh, yeah. And, and, and so, you know, there's some evidence. There, there's a, a, an apocryphal story of, a guy at White Sands that uh, went over a dune and they heard him scream and, and uh, they found him and he was mutilated. There's a story that this kind of disinformation agent, Bill English, uh, I, he's been blamed for a couple of bogus uh, sensationalized cases that don't really aren't real. But the one that I think he's most famous for is he said that there during the Vietnam War, they found a B-52 that had been set down in the jungle. There was no crash through the jungle. It was just set down. And all 12, uh, however many crew members, I think it was 10 or 12, were found strapped in their seats, mutilated. Uh, there was another one. Uh, you know, there's been uh, a number of cases uh, that have supposedly been said to exist, but, but if they do happen, they're, they're really rare. But with all the thousands of people that disappear every year, uh, maybe they're not leaving them in the pasture. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they are taking people and doing that. I don't believe for a second that there's a nightmare hall below Dulce, let's put it that way, but um, maybe there is somewhere. Uh, you know, it just I just shudder to think that that, that could be real. Uh, that, 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 you know, maybe some of these people that are missing are being used uh, to gather uh, organs. We know that there's organ gathering uh, going on in parts of the world, in Africa, uh, parts of Asia. Uh, there's rumors of organ gathering happening in, in the Ukraine right now. Uh, so it's not beyond the realm of reason that these things are happening. God forbid that they would be routine and, and happen uh, routinely. So the next question. <laughs> you got it, man. You got it. Yeah. Let's move on from that one. The Tree of Life at Patreon asks, are you aware, Chris, of any cattle mutes taking place on factory farms, or is it exclusive no. free-range animals? No, this is pretty much, uh, with rare exceptions, a a five hundred herd or less phenomenon. It generally happens on mom and pop ranches. The skeptics say, "Well, uh, there you go. It's un, you know non-professional ranchers that don't know what they're looking at." Well, they do know what they're looking at. Uh, you know, this whole idea of delusion of crowds and mass hysteria and all this. You know, if that's so, then how come we, we can go months, even years with no cases? Then all of a sudden, right. boom, we're inundated with cases. What, everybody went crazy one day? Everybody went delusional one day? And when you have all these cases happening, then everybody, all of a sudden, a, a switch gets flipped and everybody's not delusional anymore? No. It's just, you know, common sense says that yeah. that. It's not true. So uh, we don't have a single report, to my knowledge, of a case on a feedlot or on a factory farm. But why should we? Because we're mutilating them, um, uh, one cow a second in this country. <laughs> we're mutilating them all the time, every day. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, you know, you want to start talking about cows and your health and nutrition and 
you know, some of the things that uh, you should be aware of about uh, what's lurking in, in your uh, McDonald's hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> I love right. beef. I still eat beef. I, I, I only eat organic grain, you know, grain free grass fed uh, beef, local, local beef. Uh, I love it. I mean, geez, I like it rare, even, you know. Uh, I, I'm just trying to make sure that I don't do the Oprah. Oh my God! You know she had a show on Mad Cow Disease with Howard Lyman, the Mad Cowboy, and uh, she was in Abilene, Texas. And she goes, "Oh my God! I'll never have another hamburger again." Next morning, she had a guy at the door. Dunk, dunk, dunk. Here's your sir, here, here's your your uh, legal papers, and she got sued for two billion dollars by the largest the largest lobby in this country that you never hear anything about. And that's the beef industry. The beef lobby, uh, I mean, beef is the largest income producer in agriculture. And they have a tremendous amount of power and clout. And uh, God forbid you should go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. You'll lose. You know, it took the Glass-Stengel Act when it was passed, uh, you know, it was first devised in the 1890s. Uh, to break up the beef industry. And because they didn't have the political will or power to do that, they ended up breaking up the oil industry, the steel industry, and the railroads. And it wasn't until 1912 that it actually passed. But uh, beef is a huge, huge political force in this country. Very, very powerful, very, very persuasive. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, well, and, you know, something we didn't really talk about in Stalking the Herd even is uh, a lot of that book that you lay out is the relationship we have to cattle. Oh, yeah. And, you oh, know, that, yeah. that's a whole other part we could talk for hours about. Oh, yeah. But oh, our my relationship God. It's fascinating. Is so fascinating. It's fascinating. Um, you know, the whole uh, first first two chapters are very important in the book. It, it traces our... Uh, our history of in relationship with cattle. Uh, you know, when cattle started out, they were just a handful of, 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 of strains of them. And they were, they were called aurochs. They weren't even really modern day cows. They were wild animals. They were much, much bigger. They could go three, 4,000 pounds. They're 12 feet tall. This is an 8,000 year old cave painting from Algeria called it Tassili Fresco. And what you see in the bottom picture uh, on the right, you just see the front of the fresco. The, the herd of cows goes about five times this length all the way back. Uh, I, obviously, I couldn't fit the whole thing in. So I, I isolated the scene that's going on at the front. Now, the scene at the front is very interesting. If you look carefully, you'll notice that at the face of the cow, there's this weird ghost-like figure mm -hmm. that's not like the other human figures. It's definitely different. It even looks like it has some sort of implement in its hand, and it appears to be working on the cow. Now, what is that guy in the back? His, his bottom has worn away. His legs have worn away. In the original photograph, you can kind of see it's still there, but, but um, it's, this is 8,000 years old. What is he doing? It looks like he's mutilating the rear end of the cow. But it's a human. Uh, the, the severed limb is actually from the front leg, is a front leg. And uh, it's interesting that they should, you know, prominently display it. Um, and then the figures at the bottom on the extreme right, it's like a little guy is trying to hold the other guy back. And the guy in front of him with the big clank and balls, he's taunting the cows to do something about it. It's like, you don't like it? You know, and it's almost like these guys are aiding and abetting a mutilation. This is the earliest possible depiction of a mutilation that I have ever come across. And I have looked, believe me. Uh, this is a fascinating image. Yeah. And, you know, what we're dealing with here is, is humans have taken a the zebu and the auroch and, and just a handful of, of wild uh, bovines. And we've created 940 some odd breeds of cattle. Now, the most, one of the most pure strains 
is the sacred Brahma cattle, the white cattle of India. They are worshipped in that country, literally. There are nursing homes for cows in India. Wow. There are wet nurses, human women, that are hired to suckle baby calves that don't have mothers. Women, human women suckle cattle in India. I've got a photograph in my book. Um, there's various uh, god, god and goddess images uh, in the pantheon of ancient uh, traditions, whether it's uh, the Minotaur or other uh, bovine images in, you know, the uh, Minoan civilization in Greece and Rome. All the ancient civilizations had a relationship with cattle. It's sacred. In the West, it was usually the bull. In the East, it was the cow. And as we go down through history, the relationships starts to change as we're starting to selectively breed cattle and create breeds that are specialized. Now we have bullfighting in the West. We have, I'm wearing the world, fine, world uh, PBR finals hat. If you can stay on the back of a bull for eight seconds, you're one badass cowboy. It's a, by far the toughest sport there is. Uh, so that's what the, has developed in the West. In the East, they worship cattle. Now, there's millions and millions and millions of sacred Brahma cattle around the world. Millions of them. How come I've never been able to find a single case of a Brahma being mutilated? Mm -hmm. Now, that just in, in and of itself is a fascinating you know, factoid. I have never stumbled on a case of a Brahma that's been selected and mutilated. Now, th there's never been a mutilation in all the, all the years and cows in, in, in India. India is the largest exporter of cattle. Why? Because they don't eat them. <laughs> they, they have extra cows that they need to get rid of, so why not make some money? Why not? Yeah. So I think those first two chapters in my book, all pre-Snippy, basically. Snippy is where the mutilation phenomenon became internationally known. So I, I look at all the pre-Snippy cases. Our earliest documented cases that we can find are in the sheep herds around London in 1605 and in, in the spring of 1606, the winter of 1605 and 1606, right during the early uh, parts of the, uh, the reign of James I, uh, who was the next, uh, who was the king of England after Queen Elizabeth. And uh, right during that time, he was funding Macbeth being finished up and rehearsing at the Globe Theater. And Guy Fox had just tried to blow up the House of Lords at his coronation. And, uh, of course, what did they do? They hung him until he was almost dead, took him down, cut him open, mutilated him, uh, and then tore his limbs from him, cut off his head, put his head on a pike outside of the Tower of London, as, and his limbs were sent around to the corners of the realm as a warning to anybody else that wants to try to blow up the king. And <laughs> all of a sudden, right when that happened, sheep started getting mutilated all over around the shires in and about of London. Of this sundry conjectures, but most would agree that it tendeth toward fireworks. This is how <laughs> the, the quotation in the court records ends. Uh, hundreds of sheep, in some cases... In others, less, with uh, wool and towel, and wool and meat left behind, and the tallow and inward parts missing, of this sundry conjectures. <laughs> tallow was used to make fireworks uh, for anybody who was interested. So, yeah. and we also might have some some cases that happened in the Middle Kingdom of Egypt, way back. I don't really tout those very much because I haven't been able to find. Uh, uh, the actual documentation of that. But uh, it's something that's been going on a long time. We had cases in Ireland in the early 1800s, uh, in the 1920s, cases in, in Australia. Uh, there was, you know, some cases, uh, an elk, elk mutilation in 49, Washington State, the pig mutilations in uh 30s and 40s uh, in uh, Missouri, 
There were some cattle cases in the Snake River Valley in Idaho. There's evidence uh, in, in some indication that there were uh, cases that happened in the early days of the cattle industry in, in this country in the 1880s, 1890s. But uh, again, uh, evidence of that is, is, you know, I haven't been able to find it. You know, I've heard stories from ranchers saying, oh, yeah, my great granddaddy used to tell my grandpa about that, you know, stuff like that. Uh, so we don't really know uh, the extent of the history of, of these cases, but there's enough tantalizing evidence to suggest that they were happening. Now, obviously, these don't conform to some sort of government monitoring man cow disease. These are probably the core of the phenomenon. I, I liken it to, to, to the UFO phenomenon where you have your core cases that are high strange that cannot be explained by science that may be primordial like some sort of uh, primal, primordial predator that's out there that's selectively picking the best cows and, and bulls, and then human cases blossoming around them, uh, possibly to find out why the initial cases happen, uh, or possibly a, a way to provide subterfuge uh, for those cases and throw investigators off off track, uh, possibly to uh, uh, determine a variety of things, whether it's looking for oil, having uh, you know minerals, uh, which there's some some evidence to suggest you can determine that through the tongue and and uh, and and milk of of cattle. Also, um, possible, as we said, monitoring of spread of mad cow disease or the you know the blossoming and you know the appearance of mad cow. Uh, so, you know, there are a variety of explanations that, that you have to have to attempt to get to the bottom of this. And so as close as I can come to a, you know, a position statement, if you will, is there's, there's a, a multiple groups uh, are involved in this and they all have specific agendas. Uh, some may coincide with one another. Others may diverge, but uh, this is not a one size fits all thing. And it, it's definitely not soundbite material. It's very difficult to <laughs> talk about this on, you know, the hundred or so TV shows that I've been on, uh, uh, TV show segments, I should say. Um, but, um, you know, slowly the word's getting out. I mean, you know, very quietly. I, I was on two episodes of Tucker Carlson. I, you know, I got a lot of flack from my liberal friends for doing it. Uh, but, you know, Tucker actually turned out to be a fairly nice guy. He's just an entertainer, basically. He likes to stir the pot up and yeah. make a lot of money. Um, but, um, I, I did a show because I knew a lot of ranchers and a lot of farmers uh, tuned into Fox news. And when he was at Fox and I did these shows, I felt that, you know, an apolitical subject that is impacting, you know, a cross section of, of the country, uh, ir regardless of, uh, uh, you know, blue States, red States, that sort of thing. And, you know, I'm, yeah. some people would call me a bleeding heart liberal. Well, I hope the bleeding heart part isn't true. <laughs> but I've got enough problems with my heart. Uh, anyway, uh, so, you know, I did that. I was funded by Lawrence Rockefeller, you know, for two years. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, I was one of four people in, in the field that uh, were, were funded. Uh, some people have noticed the work that I'm doing. And, you know, I want to break my arm by patting myself on the back. But, you know, I think I'm a good uh, poster boy for for uh, motivation, for uh, you know, good good technique, and uh, uh, and and for staying out of my own way and and not getting a big head about it. Uh, mm -hmm. Would I like to be more famous? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> would I like to get more money for what I do? I don't get money, so yeah, some would be nice. Uh, you know, and I'm lucky to be uh, Lucky to have some, some you know, over the years, some some people have said, real dedicated followers of my work. I'm saying, man, I'm, how can I help, you know? And, uh, you know, I've, I've gotten some bequeathals here and there. And, you know, people have, have ponied up stuff uh, to help me keep going. Because, you know, the more I have, uh, the more time I have, the better job I can do. So hmm. now that I'm semi-retired, you know, I'm, uh, you know, and, and with the Internet and just... God, you go through half your day and you haven't accomplished anything because you you got to maintain all your feeds and websites and 
you know, I've, I've got a forward due at the end of the week and people want you to write for them. And I'm helping three people write books right now. And uh, so it, um, it really kind of loads up your time. Uh, uh, yeah. So I am uh, still involved in, in the field. I'm doing an eight day shoot uh, for a new show that's been out one, one year. I can't talk about it, but uh, it's one of the better cases that I've ever heard of. It's in the San, San Luis Valley in the Southern part. Uh, we're going to take a boatload of gear and we're going to shake the tree and see what uh, what shows up. And boy, we have the potential of really coming up with very interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. man, everything from 100 foot invisible bipedal creatures tramping through their trees, crushing you know full grown trees, and uh, and some really wild stuff's been reported in the area. And it's going to be really interesting to to uh, take a bunch of gear and. See what we can stir up, you know. <laughs> Careful when you poke that hornet's nest. So you I know. was just going to say that San Luis <laughs> hornet's nest. Is yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it could be. Uh, it could be exciting. Uh, cool. I'm not afraid. I've I've uh, I've been there and done that. I've experienced pretty much. I've been to some of the most haunted sites in America, and I've had hitchhikers follow me home and try to freak me out. Uh, I've had Skinwalker be interested in me for a couple of days. That's the only explanation I can come up with. Uh, I've done some pretty serious investigations on occult cases, uh, which involved powerful brujos, uh, which I will not talk about. <laughs> Fair enough, man. Fair I shouldn't enough. even have brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> You've opened but, the door now, now. Well, so um, you know, it's yeah, life's, yeah, sorry. life's life's fun. Uh, go ahead, fire me a question. Oh, sure, sure. Um, this is actually, um, I think this is a good way to wrap it up. Actually, sure. um, this last question here, um, it's it actually came from several people because they want to get your thoughts. You've been, you know, um, you've been doing the cattle mutilation thing, and like you said, you've studied paranormal, you've studied high strangeness, UFOs. Um, Today's world of UFOs, um, I kind of want to end with this because we're living, like you said, in a post-2017 sort of right. New York Times article world. Um, and now, man, it's like I never, like you said, I never thought I'd see the day where we would once again get a government-funded UFO program, which we have right now with this thing called Arrow. We just had a congressional UFO hearing take place, um, possibly more to come in the future with the Senate. Um, it seems like the government is now involved in UFOs more than ever before. Well, they acknowledge so, that they're involved. In right. So that's kind of what I want to ask you. What do you make of this new ufology that we're well, getting right now? I mean, it goes, it runs a gamut. I mean, there's some people that have been whispering about some ultimatum that's been made that they better, you better inform your population because by 2027, there's going to be a reveal by whatever it is that's living alongside us. First of all, I think that uh, we're dealing with something that is uh, ultra or um, crypto terrestrial. Uh, it's mm -hmm. something that's always been here, probably longer than we have. And the reason why it showed up in 1947 and mass was because we were starting to put it in at risk by popping off nuclear weapons. Uh, and then, and then they showed up and remember a lot of those early sightings were of large groups of craft. So it was like right. a show of force. It's like that initial swarm. When you, when you whack a, a, a bee's nest, an initial swarm comes out and starts looking around, what are you doing? Um, so first of all, it's, you know, and if that's the case, you know, you have to ask, well, where are they? They're either in the mantle of the earth or underwater. Uh, or they could be some sort of dimensional thing, uh, something that's existing alongside us dimensionally. Human senses can only detect a certain small portion of the, of the energetic spectrum. We all know this. There may be much more going on around us than we know. I've seen semi-transparent, uh, not quite fully manifest uh, 
phenomena with my own eyes I, within within feet of me. I know this is a possibility because I've seen it. Uh, and 2% of our oceans have been explored. I mean, I, I don't think it's by accident that the Navy created a Department of Intelligence back in the 1880s, way before any other Department of Intelligence existed. And why the Office of Naval Intelligence is probably a real major player in the whole UFO question, because sailors have been seeing these things. Uh, it's not by accident that you should have the Nimitz and the Princeton uh, battle group uh, out there off of San Diego be the first uh, publicly acknowledged, uh, the big, you know, the clear and go fast and tic tac mm -hmm. events. Uh, that was Navy. Now, these things have been seen, I think, by sailors for a long time. And I think that's one of the reasons why we have this Department of uh, Naval Intelligence. Now, that being said, um, the government, you know, has been run by a bunch of cold warriors that have been paranoid as hell that Soviets are going to think that uh, we know something they don't know. So it's been used as a device for counter-espionage. They've been playing footsie with, with the subject since the 40s. Now, all those guys are gone. There, you know, there are very, very few of them left. And they expect their kids to keep the lie alive. Well, the kids aren't, don't, aren't going to do that. Hmm. They want to have this, the conversation out front so that they can control the narrative. So they can be, they can lead it by the nose and tell us what to think, why to think. We're here, we're here, and we're in charge, and you're not. So they had to come up with a way to move it to the next level. Show that the government knows, acknowledge the, the actual existence, and then slowly put the clamps down on information. I mean, to me, it's a lot of window dressing. It's the government, uh, you know, being dragged kicking and screaming out into the light, and they have to say, okay, uh, we haven't been lying for 70 years. We're dealing with UAPs, <laughs> UFOs. Oh, no, 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 no. We're, we're not talking about those. Uh, we're talking about UAPs. Let's rebrand it. That way we don't have to explain <laughs> all right. the 70 years of data that's been, you know, the anecdotal data that's been slowly piling up and MUFON, and, you know, KUFOs uh, and all the rest of the groups that have been compiling data. So I think it's just, a, you know, the government's job is to control us. I mean, that's what governments are about. So if they want to control the narrative, they want to control the conversation, They've got to acknowledge it. So here we go. Boom. We've got the big uh, the big reveal that the government now is now, oh, wow, there's something going on all around us. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Well, we're in charge. You know, we'll take care of it. We'll, we'll put up a website so you have a place to call. <laughs> yeah. If anybody thinks that they're going to get anything concrete out of the government uh, related to this subject, all they're going to do is tell you what, what you want to hear. Just slowly kind of dribble it out there. I never thought I'd see where we're at happen in my lifetime, but it has happened. And, uh, I mean, God, New Yorker magazine, probably the most conservative magazine you could ever want, did an un un unjudgmental, a non-judgmental story on UFOs. David Perkins said, I I died early and gone to heaven. <laughs> and then, you know, three months later, he was gone, unfortunately. But so. Yeah. It's 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 unfortunate, but uh, you know the government has been lying for uh, to us for over seventy years. Uh, we are dealing with a very real phenomenon. Uh, it is uh, probably connected to a lot of other phenomena, and uh, you know the government wants to put blinders on. It's not by accident that when they went up to Skinwalker Ranch, they were investigating everything but UFOs. Uh, you know, that whole OSOP program uh, was geared to figure out what was going on on the ground, not in the sky. And so now that we have these TV shows that are actually kind of, you know, being fairly open about what they're doing and what, how they're doing it and why they're doing it, and it's well-funded, uh, you know, hats off to Brandon Fugel. I really admire the guy, and I hope to work with him in the future. Um this is uh, this is all good. This is all a very good thing. And, you know, I think it's exciting. It would be very exciting if I was 25 or 20 right now 
in this day and age, coming into this field at this time, man, it'd be, I would be, damn, if I had a computer back when I was starting out and I had the network of sources and, and you know, and, and data and information that I have, have now, God, it would be so much easier. I had to do things the old-fashioned way. The Dewey Decimal System and libraries I had to drive three hours to get to. You know, it's way easier now, guys. So, you know, don't don't take it for granted, you know. Yeah. Use those tools effectively. And if you need some help, I'll whip your ass into shape. <laughs> I love that, man. Chris, I honestly, I couldn't think of a better way to end it. I, I think that's um, that's a good way to end this conversation is hope for yeah. the future of this topic in citizen yeah. science hands, I think is uh, the way to go, especially with what you're doing with UFO DAP and, and all these, um, these other projects. Um, yeah. It's awesome. It, it gives me hope yeah. that we will get some answers and those answers will come from us. Don't expect it from the government ever. No. It, it's going to come from people like you. It's going to come from yeah. groups like UFO DAP or SCU. Um, and that's kind of where my hope lay in the future right. of this topic at least. So, um, but Christopher O'Brien guys will always be there to whip your ass into shape. Like he said, there you, go. Right. you know, <laughs> all you have to it. do is ask. I got my, my, my boots cocked and ready. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Cause you got to well, get your butt kicked in this field to really be taken seriously. Uh, <laughs> you do. You got to get those calluses for sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, where can we find everything you're up to, man? Give us your uh, yeah. The information well, I, I have a website that that was that was uh, unfortunately put out of commission by something or somebody for a while. Uh, it's back up and running. I have my uh, my tribute to David Perkins is there as a current uh, article. That's ourstrangeplanet.com. It's, it's a strange planet. It's ourstrangeplanet.com. All one word, of course. Um, that's my website. There's maps of the valley. There's, there's my 70 uh, places to go in the valley with the little, little user interactive, uh, uh, pins in there. Uh, there's a bunch of articles, uh, a bunch of good stuff. Um, also UFO DAP, UFO DAP.com, the UFO data acquisition project. If you're interested in being part of the team, uh, again, like I said, it, it can be as low cost as you want, and we're not here to make money. We're here to um, create, to, to do good science. So ufodap.com, and, um, you know, just kind of keep your ears open. Uh, invariably, I'll show up uh, every year on a, a, a TV show or two or three, and uh, I'm on podcasts all the time. Uh, just keep your ears open. I try to change it up, make it interesting, keep it lively. and you know, uh, there are no problems. There's only solutions that we haven't found yet. So, you know, join me in the quest. I love it. I love it, man. Chris, this was absolutely fascinating, brother. Thank you for your time, uh, your dedication to these different fields of study. Um, we, I, I truly stand on the shoulders of giants like you, man. So I Thanks. gotta I thank you for that. that. Come from you, Ryan, I, I really, you. really do appreciate that. I really do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining me today on Somewhere in the Skies. All right. Sim Salabim, everybody. <laughs> I love it. Here's our outro, guys. Thank you for joining us today with Chris O'Brien. We'll see you on the other side. Uh, join us this Sunday for our live stream. And uh, yeah, look for this episode of Christopher O'Brien next week on the podcast, guys. Thank you for joining us. And as always, keep your feet on the ground, but never stop searching Somewhere in the Skies. Take care. Take care.